All right, hello everybody. Welcome to a brand new road reflection coming at you uh, from from the road, uh, obviously. <laughs> uh, I'm running a bit of an errand, so if I seem mildly distracted in the beginning of this video, it's because I am trying to retrace some steps and um, get back to familiar territory. I had to pick up a little piece of exercise equipment, um, so hence why uh, I'm, I'm in unfamiliar territory. But uh, yeah, thing uh, gonna give a little, I guess, a little uh, little check in up at the top as as we usually do. We do a little check-in. Uh, still kind of in that depressive funk, you guys. I'm trying to shake it. It's still, it's, it's, it's better than it was a couple weeks ago where, you know, I was, I like, I wasn't doing um, much of fucking anything. Uh, I was just kind of super depressed and uh, lounging around a bunch. I would do some housework here and there. But, uh, you know, things are, things are getting better, getting better. I'm pushing myself to uh, get up and do work. This week has been particularly stressful um, and just kind of unappealing to do much of anything. If I'm being completely honest, is it's been it's been really difficult. Uh, I mentioned in in the in the last video, the previous video, uh, if you guys got an opportunity to check it out, having some hardware problems, having some hard drive problems. One of my external hard drives that I use regularly has failed. It's an eight-year-old hard drive that I've had for a super fucking long time. So, uh, you know, that comes with its own set of stresses. Got a new hard drive, got it formatted today, uh, got everything up and ready to go. Uh, mostly, I just have to double check to make sure that I have all the files uh, that I need to have in order to, uh, in order to, you know, just work with it. Um, and, you know, a few additional, t of course, in the midst of all of this, you know, additional tasks will come up, additional projects will come up, additional problems will come up. Uh, so that creates more stress and so on and so forth. So, uh, dealt with that a little bit of that yesterday and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to basically now it's like, I got to play catch up a whole bunch. Um, and like stuff I wanted to do on Monday and on Tuesday uh, th I've not been able to accomplish all of those goals because, you know, backing up large files sometimes takes a long, especially when it's on a failing hard drive, can take up a lot of time uh, and a lot of um, power from your computer, like a lot of processing power from your computer. Uh, so it's just like playing catch up and I, and I know I'm going to be exhausted and like, it's finally feeling good, so uh, and so it's just it just kind of sucks that this is this is the roadblock uh, that uh, that has come up right now. Uh, other than that, doing okay, hanging in there. That's kind of the goal. That's kind of like the goal of the weeks is to just to hang in there and make sure that I get through the goals that I have set for the day. This piece of exercise equipment is going to help with that because one of the goals is to get back. Um, into a regular exercise regimen, which I haven't been doing this week because of the additional stress of the hard drive, which kind of fucking blows. You guys, not gonna lie. Uh, I, I feel I feel more stiff. I feel not as energized as I normally would. One, you know, like it's because of the nature of what I do, getting in exercise wherever I could. Um, was super important and when I was on the road it would be a lot of body work stuff um, and you know uh, that's super helpful so I kind of got something that, that could be very helpful for uh, for the road as well uh, not not entirely sure if, if, if it will be I'll, I'll have to test it out at home and get used to it first and then see if I can maneuver it to be on the road when touring comes back which um, I guess that this would be a good good time to talk about that as I uh, grab my notebook with the notes pertaining to today's today's topics of discussion. Uh, when is touring coming back? I feel like there's always an update about about this, right? A conjecture that I make 
about when touring is coming back and um, thought about it, thought about it, uh, and you know, previously I've been I've been saying, oh, well, it'll come back early next year, right? Like hopefully by the time that I normally am on the road, uh, things will be back to normal. You know, maybe a vaccine, maybe this thing will taper out, what have you. Um, and now we we're talking about some vaccines, right? We're talking about uh, the possibility of uh, two or three vaccines. And um, we got Pfizer, which is like a 90 percent. Uh, it's like a 90 percent efficient vaccine. And then we have something else with 94. I can't remember exactly the name of the company right now. A friend of mine was telling me about it. Um, Pfizer has not taken any sort of government grants or any of that sort of stuff, which means that they are looking to absolutely turn a profit from it because they are a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and that's what they're going to do. Uh, this other company has taken government sub, uh, grants and loans and stuff like that, but uh, again, no real guarantee that they won't charge out the ass uh, because we live in a capitalist hellscape that doesn't really give a shit and looks for every opportunity to turn a profit and make endless, endless amounts of money because uh, capitalism in and of itself is a virus that can never be stopped. And I'm, I'm being a little facetious about that. It can be stopped. Uh, it's, it's up to us to, to, to stop it, to, you know, push back in any way that we possibly can. Um, but, uh, you know, let's say, let's say all things go well. The 94%, uh, approved vaccine, you know, by this company, let's say they go, yeah, we'll, we'll give it to everybody for free. We're, we're just going to, we're just going to get the fucking thing out there. Um, let's say that does happen and, and it happens by January. Well, they're going to have to come up with a way to mass produce this thing in order to get it to everybody. They're also going to have to come up with a system to ensure that people can, um, go and get this vaccine uh, you know, based on, um, need, right? Like, like who is the most, who, who, who needs this vaccine the most? Uh, well, first and foremost, I think it's going to go to, uh, a friend and a friend of mine did bring this up too, is it's going to go to the rich people. It's going to go to the movie industry. It's going to go through to, to, uh, uh, athletes, right. To, to bring sports back, because that's the priority that that keeps the that keeps the distraction machine a rolling. Uh, that keeps people, um, you know, not talking about the big important issues. It keeps us distracted. It's a nice uh, escape, right? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have sports. We shouldn't have movies. I myself enjoy a bevy of movies. I'm not a big sports guy, but you know, I'm a big I'm a big Marvel movies fan. I, I, I'm a big uh, big nerd, so you know, I do enjoy all those things. And there, and there is a place for those things. And even they aren't particularly 100% escapism because you can't do that, especially when you have uh, somebody creating any sort of art. You're going to have art that mirrors life, so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, but I think that's going to be the first place that this vaccine is going to go to, to revive this industry, to bring that back forward. Because we need, because again, capitalism needs people to go out there um, and, and spend a bunch of money. That's what it needs us to do, and that's what it's going to promote us to do. So, so that's going to be number one, and then number two will be, uh, you know, we we'll, we'll we'll talk about the elderly, we'll talk about the immunocompromised, and then uh, and then it'll be general populist stuff, um, and they'll they'll come up with an organization for that. I've heard a couple different ones, like based on your last name and your zip code. Um, you know, you'll, you'll have a particular spot that's giving out these vaccines and, uh, based on your last name and your zip code, it will, it will prompt you to go to a spot to go get this vaccine or something along those lines. Uh, I don't know if that's the best system in place, uh, but it'll be a system in place. 
it'll 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 be something um you know but here I'll get to the I guess the bigger part of this in in just a second here um but you know so let's say let's say they come up with this mass distribution by March right so so April they deliver it to the rich folks uh, May immunocompromised in the elderly and June for general, general public and there's this big divide. What happens next? I think it's going to be a little too quick to say that things will open up at you know back to normal. Everything is going to go quote unquote back to normal, which I don't think we should be looking at going back to normal. I think we should go better than normal because normal was bullshit. Uh, normal was uh, this massive income gap, thousands, thousands of people, uh, not having health care. Uh, people were having to work two to three jobs just to be able to feed their family. That's normal. That that's what we were living under. And then this pandemic hit and basically showed us how fucked capitalism is and how continuing to be in this system is just going to eat us alive. We should be looking at going to better than normal. Um, I don't think people will stop wearing masks right away. I think there will still be a, a point where, you know, maybe in July, through July and August, people will still be wearing masks. We'll, we'll probably phase that out. But then comes the question of how long does this vaccine last? Because there were a lot of reports that, you know, the um, the antibodies against COVID-19 only lasts for about three months. So do we then have to restart every three months? So when the general public is getting their, their vaccine, you know, the athletes and, and the rich folks have to fucking re-up. So does that mean that the economy gets fully open again? Probably not. Not next year. I think next next year is still going to be a difficult year based on all of this. Um, and it's something I think we should be preparing for. So, you know, on my end, and this is just, this is a, a comedian talking about foresight, uh, something that politicians and world leaders and experts and think tanks should be doing, but they don't because they're part of the capitalistic system and the capitalistic system only looks at short-term gains. How can I get the most now? Not how can I make this thing sustain? They're not looking at sustainable sustainability on any ends, especially on an economic one. How do I get rich quick and stay rich longer? That's what they want to sustain. They just want to sustain their wealth. Um, everything else can go fuck itself in terms of sustainability. Anyway, for, for, for myself, I'm looking at it going, well, I doubt, I doubt that I'll be on the road before August of next year. Um... Maybe, maybe even a little bit later. And most likely what I will end up doing is doing a short run of tours, uh, flushing out a new show, which I, you know, I have an idea of what I want the new show to be. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to call the tour the Citizen Revolution because I've been doing those as virtual shows. And if you've, you know, but that's neither here nor there. Um work that out and then figure out what I'm going to, and then I'll probably go open for Lee Camp a couple times as long as uh, how many other times he would like to have me open for him and be a part of those shows uh, but then once we start looking at the fall and winter again once we start looking at how many times do we have to take this vaccine in order to eradicate it from our society it's very much going to be dependent on you know how 
touring works just on me, just on a ground level comedian who, you know, is filling fucking 20 to 50 seats in cities. I'm not, I'm not even filling large amounts. Even, even someone like Lee Camp who fills, you know, upwards of 200 seats or Jimmy Dore who fills upwards of three or 400 seats or Graham Elwood and Ron Placone filling up like 150 seats on, on, on their own is, you know, it's, it's going to be it's going to be a trial and error basis but we don't have to so well basically what i'm saying is i'm i'm preparing myself for the first you know 8 to 9 months of next year being similar to this so setting myself up for success in terms of doing virtual shows maybe twice a month instead of three times a month because that seemed to be a little that seemed to be like a lot for me to do especially when I was writing a new show every, every week. Um, but doing that, getting audio equipment, setting up my home studio, getting settled in because, you know, I'm, I, and, and then after that, there's still no guarantee that uh, touring is going to be feasible for 2021 if the vaccine is a repetitive one. Uh, and then what happens when we have to deal with, uh, how, how, do we, how do we know that somebody got the vaccine? Do we have a way to track that? Do we have a way to denote that we did? Are we going to all have to wear armbands saying, hey, yeah, I got the COVID-19 vaccine. Oh, hey, I've, been, I've re-upped my COVID-19 vaccine. How do we enforce something like that? Because you have these anti-maskers. You have these people that think that this thing is a hoax and not real. That damage has been done. And that damage is kind of difficult to undo in this regard. So, you know, how do you re-educate people to be like, hey, this is a big deal and you know, this vaccine is important. I mean, there's, you know, and then we have the whole anti-vax crowd that that we have to contend with. There are varying degrees of conspiracy theorists. Th- theorists. And I did do a video about, like, how to deal with anti-vaxxers or, or where the anti-vaxxer psychology comes from. Um, you know, and I think shunning those people will only... Um, well, I think we'll only make things worse. Uh, they have to be educated and they have to find a reason for this to be a reality. And and honestly, what what's going to happen is you're going to see a bunch of people within those three months start getting it. So the cases aren't going to go away, which means that we're going to have to keep getting people vaccinated. So again, you know, am I going to be back on the road in August is is. Are we going to see live events and things of that sort next August or, or next September? Maybe it, it's really going to depend on how how the 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 anti-mask anti-vax people deal with this and what's going to happen to them when there's when when there's a large percentage of the populace that is vaccinated, but within them there's a higher risk that they're going there's going to be community spread which is what we're seeing now. But how do you enforce it? Especially in a country like this that is so hell-bent on freedom over logic. It's not freedom with logic, right? Like, logic isn't a part of freedom. You don't have the freedom to be logical. Uh, In fact, more often than not, overwhelming logic... Overwhelming freedom means less logic. So how do you how do you do? I don't know. I don't I don't particularly have an answer to that uh, other than, you know, you got to wear a fucking wristband or you got to what do we put it on your fucking ID and people have to scan the ID to be like, OK, this guy got the, the fucking thing, you know, or, or this gal got her thing and. For fuck's sake, like, there's travel advisories in the state of Pennsylvania where they're saying that you have to be tested 48, 72 hours before you come in. You have to have your results as negative before you come into the state. 
but they have no way to enforce that. And then there's also the issue of there are certain places, certain cities, where the state lines are too close. So, like Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri. You know, people in Philadelphia work in New Jersey. People in Steubenville, Ohio work in Pennsylvania. People in parts of West Virginia work in Pennsylvania, vice versa. So how do you monitor something like that? How do you get, gain an exemption for something like that? And this is what I mean is you have to have foresight because it's not like they didn't know that the surge was coming. Due to lack of fucking planning. Joe Biden keeps talking about how he has a plan. Why didn't you put it out there? Why didn't you itemize some shit? You know who fucking did though? Fucking Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders itemized his plan. Put it out there of how to deal with this pandemic back in March. Old boy wasn't even running at that point. Just was like, this is I think what we should do. Anybody want to adopt these ideas and fucking make it happen? I'm here. Let's do, let's, let's do it. Joe Biden's like, I have a plan. Testing. Science. Yelling very loudly about Trump. Having a scowl on my face. And then saying something weird about black people. That's how you deal with the pandemic. Alright. I have a couple things I do need to get to. Uh, first of all, I wanted to get to this in the last video, but I, but I just ended up not having enough time to get into it. I want to address this thing about uh, progress over purity or progress over perfection. Um, I, I'm, I'm seeing this used a lot against people, uh, essentially people that aren't falling in line with the Democratic Party. Um, and I, I think this rhetoric of progress over perfection or progress over purity, whatever you want to call it. This particular rhetoric uh, is, an, is another way for the Democratic Party to get rid of, chastise, and attack real fucking progressives. Real, real leftists that are talking about real progressive ideologies, right? And here's the thing. Joe Biden is not progress, the only difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump is uh, bravado. Or I should say the level of bravado. Uh, Joe Biden is probably not going to legislate via Twitter because he doesn't know that he has a Twitter, probably. Um, but, I mean, Joe Biden is just as aggravated of an old man. He's just as racist, just as much of a war hawk just as much of a neoliberal and just as much of a Republican as Donald Trump. The only thing is, sometimes he says things nicely. And it becomes a facade. It becomes a facade for people to compromise and give up on actual things, on actual basic needs, on actual policies that the people want to see. But because he's microscopically better than Trump, People call that progress, and that's not progress. Progress is a dynamic change. Progress is something significant. I don't trim my fingernails and mean like, I made progress with my hands today. I made hand progress. Look at this. Trim those things up. Buttes. Buttes. Progress would be if I improved my arm strength to the point where I can squeeze an apple and explode it. That's progress in my hands. Real progress and not this commercialized version of progress. right? This commercialized pro version of progress is, oh boy, we have a half-black vice president woman and as much as that is a big fucking deal in a, in a country that is as sexist and racist as America is, she is part of the racism in America. Commercialized, commercialized progress, right? 
just just the exterior looks different. But when it comes down to real progress, when it comes down to uh, legislating things like Medicare for all, canceling student debt, a universal basic income during a pandemic, or period, just a universal basic income period, which still has its issues and would be part of capitalism, so on and so forth. Small business support, right? Like you gave you gave trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars to the banks. And when people were like, hey, what about us? They were like, what the fuck? We just made out of money? Oh my God, we had to pay our owners. You fucking jamokes. What the fuck? And, and Biden's still part of that. But hey, he's got a black lady VP, so I guess problem solved? I don't know. It's not purity. It's not perfection. It's asking for what what we need it's saying hey if you are the represent if you are uh, representing the people then you need to listen to what the people are saying and what the people are saying is yes identity politics is nice but if identity politics is just an excuse for you to continue behaving shittily then that's almost nothing and that's almost just as bad This isn't purity or perfection. This is asking for what we need and saying that if, if, if the politicians aren't going to give it to us, then we will figure out a way to get it for ourselves. On that note, that brings us to the, to the next topic of discussion too. And I, and I brought this up in yesterday's video, uh, this idea that you know, I, I think the American people should be voting on legislation. They should be voting on the laws that get passed on this country rather than, uh, you know, bought and sold Congress people that, um, that write these laws and they use these legalese and it becomes these, you know, it, 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 it's comical because like some of these pieces of legislation that gets written is like a couple hundred or, uh, you know, a thousand pages long. And, and these senators and Congress people and representatives and all these fucking people, they don't even fucking read it. They're just like, oh, it's a bill about giving people health care. It's a bill about making sure that tech oligarchs don't control the First Amendment. Nah. And they don't even know what the fuck is in it. So then when, when people find out about it, when journalists read through it, uh, and independent journalists read through it, and they reveal it, they come out and they go, well, I mean, how do you expect us to... It's a thousand... Have you read a thousand pages? I've never even seen a thousand pages. We had some fucking intern... And he wrote a report as a summary, of, and that's what they do. So even these lawmakers, these Congress people, don't read their own fucking shit. So shouldn't it be that the legislation is easy to understand? So that these, so that these poor Congress people can understand the laws that they're willing that that they're that they're that that they're legislating. Think about the Congress people, you guys. Their, their brain doesn't have a lot of space for a couple hundred pages of laws. You know, there's, there's the water bottles and the prostitutes uh, and which lobbyist cock is going to be jammed down their throat. Or, la- or vaginas, I don't know. I don't know how they roll. Who are they going to orally satisfy this afternoon? Which, which lobbyist? Is it the fossil fuel lobbyist? Is it the banker, banking lobbyist? Who knows? That's all they got space for in their brains, you know? Now we're asking them to think about laws using words like these and thous. And... So Senator Mike Gravel, uh has a very interesting idea. Uh, an idea that I, I honestly, I, I kind of didn't realize that Senator Mike Ravel had actually talked about it. I talked about, uh, w- wouldn't it be cool if we, leg- if we like voted on laws uh, when I did my rank choice voting video uh, a few months back. And I brought up this idea and I thought, what a, what a, what a, d- a very different idea it was. I wonder if anybody else has talked about it. And, and turns out, yes, Mike Ravel. Uh, If you're unfamiliar with Mike Ravel, this dude ran for president in 2008 and in 2020. 
uh, and instantly would have been like a way better candidate than uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, Joe Biden, and Barack Obama put together and fused into one super neoliberal. Uh, way better, right? Um, but Mike Gravel in 2008 basically came out and called out uh, Biden, Obama, and Clinton as war criminals. Uh, specifically Joe Biden, by the way. He specifically called out Joe Biden and said that, you know, he's like, there's a great, it's going around the internet, you should really check it out, but he's like, some of these people frighten me. Uh, Joe Biden, Obama, and Clinton in particular, uh, and and he straight up calls Joe Biden a, a war hawk because he fucking voted, like, he's like, I've never seen anybody, like, not, he's never met a war he doesn't like. You know, and I was like, holy shit, that's fucking crazy. So, He's not. He wasn't allowed back uh, on any debate stage ever again because he basically like pulled the mask off of these people, you know. And the DNC was like, "Stop being such a purist. You want to see less dead people in the Middle East? Stop being such a purist. Look, if you want to make an omelet, you're gonna have to crack some eggs, and the eggs in this situation are all the brown people and." Uh, the Middle East, and whatever country that we deem is evil. You're being a purist. I wish you were an egg. So in 2020, when he ran for president again, um, and his campaign was actually put together by by young people, by uh, people in their 20s put together his campaign, uh, Mike Gravel was not allowed to be on the debate stage, even though, even though he met all of the bullshit and arbitrary requirements that the DNC fucking put up there. Even though he met those. Okay. Uh, So, Gravel uh, talks about this idea that people should be voting on legislation. And and why is that a good thing, right? Uh, So, Gravel, in his book, is quoted to say that uh, there, there are two venues for change. The government or the people, and the government has no interest. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, by the way. Um, the government has no interest in changing. The government is about locking itself into power by doing absolutely nothing. Um, and uh, the, the other way is the people, and the people uh, essentially gaining more power by, by creating a legislature for the people. And he goes to point out that the framers in the Constitution very conveniently left out a way for the people to make laws, so for the people to be a, uh, a, a participant in the lawmaking process, right? And they did that probably on purpose. Uh, they did that in a way to make sure that the, that, that the upper echelon will control politics, that will, they will control the laws, uh, and, and the plebes will have to follow in, in, in suit. His idea is basically that the citizens would vote on legislator, legislature. It would be easy to read, be written in plain English, and it would be 500 words, uh, like 500 words max. Which is, which is, I mean, that's the thing is like, why do you need it to be longer than that? I don't think you do. I think I think you can very easily express a, a a legal idea in 500 words, and if you can't, then I think that means that there's going to be some shady shit thrown in there. If if there's some these thous big words legalese thrown in there, then you know some shady shit's going on. That's how these laws are written now. There's always some sort of loophole contingency. Be clear about what it is. A few years ago, I did a I did a video talking about how uh, the Supreme Court uh, dictated that you know evidence uh, that was ascertained by the police by illegal means, without a search warrant, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's legal now. It, you know, it, it's no longer inadmissible from from the courts. It's legal. 
So if they stop and frisk you and find something then and they decide that they wanted to take you to court, they can do that. Well, maybe the people could have voted on that. And they would have probably said, no, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. Uh, there, this, this, is, this is opening a lot of Pandora's boxes here. And we would have probably seen a decrease to the police state. We would have probably seen a decrease to the racist, unequal, unfair criminal justice system that we see now. Aside from that, what this really does is make the citizens participants of the law. That's what it does. It makes the citizens a participant of the law. And that's what we need. We need to, we, we need to be more participatory um, in, in, in the legal process, in, in, in the way the politics works, right? Uh, it'll, it'll make us have a less passive relationship with voting. Because I think we do have a passive relationship with voting in America. You know, we go to the ballot box and we and we pick our favorite racist and go, well, this guy will fucking do it. And then they don't. And they go, oh, well, let's do it again. I did my part. Civic duty done for four years. It's very passive. Uh, and I'm not saying that's all Americans, but it's a lot of them. And it's even people that know the history of this country, understand what election fraud is, understand how it's being committed by the duopoly, yet they will participate in it and then take a step back and be like, go ahead, corrupt system, you take the steering wheel. Take the wheel, duopoly. This removes that. This also gets rid of the electoral college. It gets rid of us fawning over political candidates and makes them the be all end all of, uh, of of all ideas and all thoughts that they can do no wrong and even if they do wrong we will find some sort of horse shit loop around way of saying well here's what it, it, it you know instead of just being like you know what i like this politician i fucking disagree with what they're saying this really sucks about what they're doing no more of this political theatrics and, 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 and voting on personalities. It's really got to be about the ideas. And it's really got to be about an educated populace. That's what a legislator of the people will do. And the only reason people will be against this is because they're lazy and they're apathetic to be participatory in that. If that's part of our daily routines, think of how much that would actually fucking change. The dynamics that it would change. It would mean that you can't leak, like you can't have people work two to four jobs. You can't have people busting their ass for for twelve hours a day and not have any fucking you know mental bandwidth for intellectual thought. It would it would change the way that society runs. There would also be no more secrecy, right? You have to be upfront. If there is a piece of this of a legislation that people are voting on that is confusing for any for any for any reason, uh, and these legislators can't clear it up, these elected officials can't clear it up, then I guess you're going to have to rewrite the fucking bill to make it clear. No more shadow governments. This deep state bullshit won't work. A more educated populace will eventually mean the erasure of anti-intellectualism. Well, you know, you don't think within these two lines. And that's it. I think maybe Gordon Dimmick pointed this out when I did the action for Assange uh, vigil um, a week or two ago. What, a week or two ago? Probably. Uh, something along those lines. But he brought up the fact that, like, uh, Americans are some of the most propagandized people 
on the planet. And I do believe that's. I don't think that's untrue. By the way, I think that is wholeheartedly fucking true. Um, this this will this will very much reduce that. It'll be it'll be a lot harder to propagandize when you have to fit in five hundred words. What the oligarchs are afraid of is an intelligent populace that can't be propagandized. We should be voting on laws. We should be voting on policy. We should be voting on legislation. And that, by the way, is not perfection or purity. That's called real fucking progress. That's transformative. That's doing better for society. And that's doing better for people. That's a system we need to try. What's working... Uh, or rather, sorry. What, what we have in place is not working. So we need to try something new. And we need to try something different. And we need to have the courage to fucking do it. Sidebar. I, d- I did order the ebook. Uh, so I can hopefully try to read it at some point uh, in the in the near future. Here, reading books can get, sometimes gets difficult for me because I just end up having I, like I, I just end up having no time to actually sit and have the leisure time to to read because of all the things that I'm doing between being a content creator, being a, a full time comedian, being a graphic designer, and having a side gig to like make ends meet. So. Uh, but I am, I am trying to get to a point where my schedule will allow at least one day a week where I can sit and read for a few hours and process some stuff. But uh, that is a book that is now currently on my list, uh, among various other books. Okay, uh, one last uh, topic of discussion. We're at, uh, this is the end of the Trump era, and is, this is also the end of the Trump militaristic era, right? So there's a couple things that are changing. Abby Martin did a great breakdown of what's going on. Uh, she does the Empire Update. Um, oh boy, there's already a nativity scene out. Uh, and it, yeah, okay, that's fine. Whatever. Uh, I, I always think it's like way too early when nativity scenes show up in uh, like November before Thanksgiving and shit. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so Trump just Trump just gave the UAE more weapons. Uh, they their UAE is basically against Iran and against um, Yemen, so it's basically like cool. You just funded a bunch. You just basically funded more war. Essentially, is 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 what happened there. Uh, and not only that, but he put more sanctions on Iran uh, during a pandemic. When that when when people people of these countries, why are we putting economic sanctions on any country? Period. But even during a pandemic, it's just cold and heartless. And again, if Democrats really want to fucking separate themselves, you would come out and be like, "We're lifting economic sanctions in all these countries during the pandemic." Like Venezuela has, first of all, by, by the way, Venezuela has been doing awesome during this pandemic, despite American economic sanctions. Uh. FYI, like they've their their death rates are way lower than ours. Their uh, positive rates are way lower than ours. They've been giving their people like they canceled rents. They're feeding their people better than America is, and all this with American economic sanctions on top. Imagine how better they would be doing, and and maybe we could like learn some shit from them if we weren't too busy, uh, you know tickling our own balls with the feather of American exceptionalism. That got that metaphor got weird. But, you know, Iran, uh, they put sanctions on them and they can't get medical equipment, they can't get treatments that they want. This is this is a, a violation of human rights. At this point, economic wars on these countries is a violation of human rights. It's bullshit. And this was after we assassinated one of their top military officials who was on a peace mission in Iraq 
and we fucking blew him up and assassinated him. And then we were like, we got the big terrorist guy. And they were like, this guy was a fucking general that bailed out America and Syria a bunch of different times. So what happened after that? So, and then, you know, he fired one of the Raytheon lobbyists uh, that wanted to, you know, and, and that, that was like pro continuing the war in Afghanistan. And everybody's like, oh my God, is he going to pull troops out of Afghanistan? And then he put an even bigger fucking neocon. In, in place that is just like yo I'm t- like he didn't say this literally but he might as well have uh, this guy Miller basically you know I'm super paraphrasing here is, is basically the kind of guy that's like Afghanistan needs to be a fucking parking lot made out of glass blah 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 like that's the guy that he put into place so that's not ending anytime soon this guy wants to keep the war going. Uh, and then there's a, a general by the name of General McGregor who's basically calling to leave. He's like, we got to get the fuck out of there. Why are we even there? We shouldn't be there, period. Uh, but there are Trump generals that want to that want stay and, you know, they're talking about why they need modest troops in, uh, in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Afghanistan. They need modest troops. You know, just your average modest troop that's just like hanging out... Talking about like helping the community, they're raking leaves for the people. You know, they're they're playing soccer with the kids. They're helping them out with their tutoring and their math and shit. While they have fucking M16s wrapped around their chest. But the coup de gras of all this comes from uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, America's most deadly kid, care bear. Uh, he, claims, he claims that America will uphold and respect human rights, uh, which is a lie because look at what they've been doing to Julian Assange. Mike Pompeo fucking hates Julian Assange and has, and has basically kept this dude uh, in a state of constant torture over a bullshit extradition for revealing how uh, the the CIA under Mike Pompeo was violating the Constitution and spying on its own people. How can you say that you uphold human rights when you are in a constant state of endless war? Just all the time. Just killing a bunch of people. Putting economic sanctions on countries during a pandemic. You can't make that statement. This is not... This is, you, you have zero grounds for moral superiority in this situation. How can you say that you're, you're, you're going to stand up for human rights when you have police brutality at your home, militarist, militarized police at your home that have waged a war on the people, that have waged a war on people of color for decades? You can't. Mike Pompeo might be the greatest liar of all time. And it, 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 it's truly sad when people just fall for that shit and think he's awesome because he's fucking not. Uh, and this is not the end of it. Biden's going to do the same thing. There, there's going to be, con- you know, more, continue continuation of the endless wars, more funding of these countries, the these these pro-Israel, anti-Iran, anti-Syria countries. We're going to try to escalate a war with Iran itself. We're going to try to escalate a war with Venezuela and, and Bolivia. Biden is not progress. Not even close. All right, uh, let's wrap things up here. Thank you guys for tuning in. As always, you know the drill. Like, share, subscribe. Um I'm going live on Friday, so if you haven't subscribed to uh, any of my channels, my Rockfin channel, my YouTube channel, my Facebook page, uh, or you're, if you're not on my email list, make sure you do those uh, because that'll give you notifications of when I go live, uh, when I'm putting out videos. Um, I, I send out an email once a week with a compendium of all of the shit that I've released for that week. Um, and uh, yeah, go to my website for, for all those links. Go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, I hope to see some of you guys on the live stream on Friday. It's super fun. 
uh, I, I, you know, I do the segment, then I read the comments at the end of the segment and chit chat a little bit with you guys. Um, so it's, uh, I, I really enjoy it and, you know, I'm working on getting my home studio up and together, but till then, thank you so much for tuning in. I love you guys. Once again, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. Uh, and, uh, till the next one, we'll see you on the road.